Welcome to Wednesday's edition of Renew Plus. I'm Pastor Tony. Thank you for joining us here at midweek of our final week of the series, The Born Supremacy, where we're looking at the authority of the believer. Now, this week, our final week, we're really zeroing in on the reality of the authority that we have in the name of Jesus and how to exercise that authority in our life for the good of ourselves and for those around us. So we've been looking at the power and the authority that God invested, that He conferred in the name of Jesus. I want to look at another scripture today uh, that pertains to this in Philippians, the second chapter. Philippians chapter 2. Powerful verses here about that powerful name of Jesus. Philippians chapter 2, verse number 8. And it says, And being found in the appearance as a man, Jesus humbled himself, and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. He's talking about when Jesus went to the cross and he absorbed our punishment, he became sin for us, not because of his own, but by identification with us, he became sin and suffered on the cross, uh, that brutal uh, crucifixion and death in, in the cross. Then it says in verse number 9, Therefore God also has highly exalted him. When did he do that? On the third day, when, when Jesus was justified in, in the Spirit, when He had paid the price for our ransom, for our redemption, for all time, for all men, God highly exalted Him. He lifted Him up out of that place. And He said He highly exalted Him. Where did He go? He went into heaven and sat at the right hand of God. And He has given Him the name which is above every name. I want you to see that right there that God gave Jesus, the name of Jesus, is the name that's above every other name. You know, it's just kind of inbred in all of us, in mankind, to name everything. I remember when I was growing up, even when, when I was small, three or four years old, when I had a stuffed animal, it was just inbred in us to name it something. You had to name it, you know, whatever. You know, you want to name your car, you want to name this. People want to name every sickness and every disease, every condition. Well, you know what? When we put a name on it, then we all automatically know that it's underneath the name of Jesus. It's underneath the authority of Jesus' name. Now, that's good for us right there because when, when they name a sickness or a disease, and they always do, sometimes it's a long name that you may, may not pronounce, it automatically falls underneath the authority of the name of Jesus because it says the name that's above every name. There's not a name out there that's above the name of Jesus. Not even a name out there that's even equal to the name of Jesus is far, 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 far above every other name. Now notice he says there in verse number 10 that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of those in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth. So he tells us right there that the authority of Jesus, which is in the name of Jesus, has to do with all three realms, in heaven and on earth and those things that are under the earth. When he says things under the earth, he's talking about the governments of hell. He's talking about the gates of hell that Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. It's because we've been given authority over all the governments of hell. We've been given authority over all this earth realm. That would include the forces of nature. That would include other things that get out of sorts and out of line. We're to use our God-given authority in the name of Jesus. And notice what happens when we use the name of Jesus in faith. It says every knee will bow. Every knee will will bow his knee to the name that's above every name. And notice verse 11, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus' lordship and mastery is over everything in all three realms, in heaven, on earth, and things under the earth. Now I wish we had time, more time to get into that right there because that is an in-depth study of its own right there. But notice right there what the name of Jesus gives us authority in. All three realms over every name that is named. Because Jesus' lordship is extended to every realm right there. That is good right there. Now, let's look over to uh, the Gospel of John chapter 14. 
with all these things in mind that we've been going over now for eight and a half weeks, I want to give you a scripture here that I tell you, I read over the scripture because I read through the New Testament many times growing up. I was a believer, but there was a couple of, there is many things actually that I just kind of just glazed over and paid no attention to. And this is one of them. And in fact, uh, most people don't even know this verse is in the Bible. And I want to pick it up here in John chapter 14 and uh, verse number uh, 9. It says, Jesus said to him, talking about Philip, he, uh, because Philip had said, show us the Father and it is sufficient for us. And Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father also. So how can you say, show us the Father? Verse 10, do you not, do you not believe that I am in the Father? and the Father in me. Now I want you to see that right there, that Jesus saw himself forever united with his Father. And see, that's what, that was the, 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 that was his method of operation, and that was the gas in the tank for him going out and doing the miraculous things that he did. Well, see, likewise for us, in our own mind and heart, we, we should never see ourselves separated away from Jesus. And of course, that links us up with the Father God, the Most High God himself because we're in Christ. I want you to see the identification, the union, the relationship that, that Jesus saw himself in with the Father right there. He goes on to say, the words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me, he does the works. See, it's not us that's carrying out these works. It's really Jesus in us. It's the Father in us who does these works. That's what Jesus is telling us right here. He said, that's why he said, have I been with you so long? When he said, show us the Father, he said, have I been with you so long and yet you've not known me? He who have seen me has seen the Father also. Boy, I tell you, that is an awesome statement right there. Now, notice verse 11. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sake of the works themselves. Now, we're going to do a series down the road on the identification of the believer. And we're going to get into some of these things right here. But I tell you, these are powerful verses that he's talking about right here. And this leads up to this verse right here in verse number 12. I tell you, he is fixing to drop a bomb on his disciples. And he's fixing to drop a bomb on us right here. Verse number 12, it says, Most assuredly, when Jesus said most assuredly, or verily, 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 I say to you, what he's about to say to them, he says, they're gonna, you're, you're going to have reason to doubt what I'm about to say. He said, but I'm shooting straight with you. He said, I want you to pay attention. I want you to just go in one ear and out the other. He said, most assuredly, I say to you, he who believes in me. Well, we believe in Christ, don't we? We've accepted him. He is our Lord. We've confessed him as our Lord. We've been born again. This would include us also. He who believes in me. The works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. <laughs> Again, I just, you know, I read over this and just, uh, it, it just did not catch. You know why it didn't catch? Because we've been so religiously brainwashed so much and so, we've thought so low of ourselves and so apart from God and apart from Jesus that we just thought, well, this, he couldn't mean what he's saying here. He must be talking code language. Well, that's why, again, he said, most assuredly, I say to you. He, well, people say, well, that was for the early church. That's for the, that's for the disciples who were sitting there. No, he says, he who believes in me. He didn't say for just you, you folks, just you 12 and no more. He said, he who believes in me. That would include you and I also, any generational believer right here. He says, the works that I do, he will do also. Now, how can he make such a statement right there? Because when you begin to see that we are in Christ, we're identified with him, we're in union with him, that we have his authority, we have that power that raised him from the dead, and we have his name to go out and do these things, then you can see that this is exactly, he, he intends for us to do this right here. He says, the works that I do, you're going to do it also, and greater works than these he will do. You say, well, what are the greater works? Well, it would surely include the new birth. 
because at that point in time, Jesus hadn't gone to the cross, so there was nobody actually born again, nobody actually filled with the Holy Spirit in that sense of, of a new covenant believer. So in that regard, there are greater works there. The greatest miracle, the greatest work ever, is the work that's done inside of a person, in their spirit, when God makes them a new creation and they're born of God. But I think there are also some other greater works than that. Uh, we could say quantity as well, because there's so many more of us than there were of them. We can do greater things in quantity measure. But I think there may be other things as well. You say, what are those? I don't know. Let's just, I, I like what Brother Kenneth E. Hagin used to say, let's just do the works of Jesus, and, we'll, and then we'll figure out what the greater works are down the road, okay? But notice that Jesus himself said, this is in words in red right here. He says, because I go to my Father. Now, he said that several times. Now, why did he say that? What was that statement? What, what did that statement mean? Because, hinged on this fact, this reality, because I go to my Father. Well, remember we read earlier about the ministry of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 16. And one of the things that he mentioned there is that the Holy Spirit is trying to convict, convict or convince. That word convict means convince to convince us, the believer, of righteousness, he says, because I go to my Father. Notice that it really wasn't all complete until he went to his Father, presented himself, and presented his blood on the heavenly holy of holies in heaven. That's when our justification was sealed. That's when our righteousness was sealed once and once for all. It is a done deal. It's done and over with. It's finished. And you know what? Because Jesus went to the Father, we have right standing with God. You wouldn't be in that seated in that heavenly seat at His own right hand without being in a right standing with God. I'm talking about perfect, first-class righteousness. You know, a lot of people think, well, maybe we have kind of an economy-class righteousness, a second or, or third-rate righteousness. No, Jesus came to give us His very own righteousness. It is our, His right standing with God. He conferred that on us. That's why we are seated with Him in heavenly places. 1 John 4, verse 17 again, As Jesus is, so are we right now in this world. He's referring to being justified and being right with God, being at favor with Him. And He says, because of that reality, He says, the works that I do, you'll do also. We, he, Jesus not only went to the Father Himself, He took us with Him. Jesus came out of the presence of God, came down here to become sin for us, pay the sin price, destroy the works of the devil, and restore that authority and dominion that God intended for us to have before the foundation of the world back on us again. And He returned to the Father in order to administrate that right there as High Priest. And you know what? We have that authority of Jesus, and we're to operate in that as the body of Christ in the earth again. We can expect to do the works of Jesus and the greater works. I'll tell you, that is powerful. Now let's go over to Mark chapter 1. I don't have a whole lot of time here, so uh, I may have to kind of stop. But Mark chapter 1, real quickly, and notice, if we're to do the works of Jesus, what kind of works did Jesus do? Well, here in Mark chapter 1, in verse 21, it says, then they went into Capernaum, and immediately, immediately on the Sabbath, Jesus entered the synagogue and taught. See, that was part of Jesus' works, his teaching. It wasn't just miracles. It was preaching, teaching, healing, doing miracles as well. Verse 22, And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority and not as the scribes. So you know what? That got, they got everyone's attention that day. Everyone's attention and focus was on the fact that Jesus was distinguished from the scribes and the religious leaders of the day. What was it? It was because Jesus taught them as one having authority, not as them. They didn't, they didn't teach as having authority. They taught as being nothing, being no one, being unworthy. But Jesus came and taught as one having authority, and that got everybody's attention. They really weren't paying attention to what donkey he came in on or what kind of clothes he had on. They were very impressed with the kind of authority that he presented in his teaching. Then it says, uh, <clears throat> verse 23, Now there was a man in their synagogue who had an unclean spirit. That's a demonic force. And he cried out, saying, 
let us alone. This was the demon speaking through him. Let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, took authority over that demonic spirit, and he said, he rebuked him saying, be quiet and come out of him. He didn't give him a dissertation. He said, shut up and come out. And when the unclean spirit had convulsed him and cried out with a loud voice, he came out of him, just like Jesus commanded. Then verse 27, then they were all amazed, so they, they questioned among themselves, saying, what is this? What new doctrine is this? For with authority, with authority, he commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. Jesus taught with authority, and he commanded demon spirits with authority, and they did what he said, and they were all amazed and impressed with that right there. Jesus came demonstrating the authority that he had. That is part of the works of Jesus, and that's part of the works that we're to do also. Well, that's all the time I've got for today. Join us again tomorrow. If you'd like additional resources and materials, go to TonyCowan.org. We will see you tomorrow.